And I said, did you ever have the imposter syndrome? You know, when you were at UC Berkeley working for these famous Nobel laureate, you know, physicists, did you ever feel like you weren't good enough? He goes, what do you mean, did I? I still feel the imposter syndrome. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, I feel it worse than ever. And I said, you got to explain. What are you talking about? And he said, when you win the Nobel Prize, you go to Stockholm, you meet the king, you bend down and he puts this golden, gilded, engraved image of uh, Alfred Nobel on your neck and you get a check for some fraction or 100% of a million dollar uh, payout. And uh, and you get this portrait, this really beautiful portrait. I tried to reproduce the portraits with a really nice work of an artist in this book. I think he did a wonderful job. And um, and 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 then you have to sign this ledger that says, "Yes, I received my Nobel Prize and all the accoutrements and delicacies therein." And uh, and he said, "When I did that, I'm a very curious person. I couldn't resist who signed it before me." So he turned back the pages. He saw Richard Feynman, Marie Curie. And he saw Albert Einstein and he said, Dave, and the hair still stands up. He said, I'm not worthy. I am not Einstein. I am not good enough to be there. And it made it me feel completely inadequate, completely un up to the task, not up to the task. And now I'm in the same league as Einstein. I do not deserve it. And I said, thinking quickly, I said, Barry, guess what? You know who also had the imposter syndrome? Albert Einstein. Because Albert Einstein was in awe and wholly inadequate before Isaac Newton. Speaking of Woody Allen and Sleeper, do we still not have the cryo sleep things? I mean, they were in Interstellar too. They're in all the alien movies. Do those things exist? Where are we at with those things? I don't know. Every time I go down to my biology lab, uh, colleagues are always asleep or you know, <laughs> intersecting frogs. And you know, if you had access to those many chemicals and drugs, Dave, what would you be doing? You I mean, come on, put yourself in a bag in some hot water usually, and then and then they get you. It was in the Martian you know, too. Those, with uh, one what's of those brownies name? that you still have left over from 1997. Exactly. I wish I had those. John Mather, the <laughs> collaborator. Yeah, John is an incredible guy who also is kind of a wonderkind and and did a, uh, a tremendous amount of work. He is the stereotypical, although he's not a professor. He's a stereotypical, you know, professor, just super uh, super smart, can answer, knows everything about about you know the the field, and has contributed to many many great uh, great discoveries, and is about to be the chief you know, scientists behind this new space telescope that's going to be launched in December, hopefully after a 20 year delay. It's one of the most expensive projects NASA has ever done. And it's a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, which has revealed more wonders and mysteries of the cosmos than any other project. Um, and so he uh, he discovered uh, not serendipitously. So he's an example of a different type of scientific discovery, which is that you make an extremely precise measurement of a known quantity, something that we knew existed, this microwave background radiation that I study, comes in all directions, originally discovered in New Jersey. and uh, But he made the most exquisite measurement ever that put the nail in the coffin of any other alternatives that could plausibly be said to be responsible for the uh, appearance of our universe. Namely, there are people that believed up until then, in the uh, early 90s, that the universe could have existed forever in what's called a steady state. And the measurements that he did for technical reasons really destroyed all hope for those who believed in an alternative to what we now call the Big Bang uh, 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 initiation of the universe. So he is, uh, you know, this really quintessential workmanlike, studious, bookish, very, very bright, and very, very diligent. He just keeps going. And he, again, these guys could all retire and be, you know, super famous and, and do whatever they want to do. Uh, and yet he's working super hard on this on this next great space telescope, the the dividends of which may not come for decades or more. How does it go for a guy like that when he sort of puts that final nail, as you put it, and it, and it sort of blows up what many in his field think about something? I, I suspect there's probably a lot of resentment. There's probably a lot of denial, but slowly kind of people come along usually? Yeah, well, that's what's so interesting. In that chapter, he talks about the importance of listening to your critics, but not too much. And I kind of summarize this as, as a trait, um, you know, in, in my students. I say, you have to be humble. You have to, nobody likes someone who's not humble. And we'll talk about, you know, imposter syndrome and stuff in a little bit, I'm sure. But you need humility, but you need swagger too. You need the swagger to know that you're doing a good job, that you are competent. You can't just go, oh, I'm timid, I'm humble, I'm, yeah, I can't do anything. Um, and in his case, 
there were these really vociferous calls that, you know, that the Big Bang is wrong and it's actually just a product of, you know, of, of religious scientists, if you can believe such a thing. <laughs> and and uh, this this impulse that human beings have to believe in Genesis 1-1, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, he said, you can listen to those people, you can respect their scientific contributions, uh, but you shouldn't listen so much that you uh, really undermine your own confidence. So it's listening to your critics not necessarily letting their comments go to your to your heart, but um, but but maybe ingesting them into your mind, processing them analytically, and saying, is there a way? And I translated this, and we talked about this before. You know, steel. Can you steel man your critic, and can you build up his or her counter argument to your pet theory or pet experiment? And if you can't. It's not a guarantee that you're wrong. You may be right, and they may be just a blundering idiot who just believes in some stupid model. Uh, but in the case where you can actually reproduce their arguments, it makes your case that much more strong. And I think that's a trait I want to imbue and you know other people to to take to heart, no matter what their field. And I think he exemplifies that. I suspect that goes far better in the laboratories that you people work in rather than the Twitterscape. I'm pretty <laughs> well. Yeah, that's, pretty sure yeah, I don't need to run an experiment on that. My life has been a living experiment of that. Uh, we've got one more, and then if you don't mind, I'm going to throw in my own scientist. I have not Absolutely. planned anything in advance with you, but I'm going to throw in someone that has influenced me Absolutely. tremendously. Uh, but the last one, number nine, Barry Barish, uh, the avuncular avatar. Yeah. So Barry kind of represents the physicist that I want to be and that, and that the avatar aspect of that. And avuncular because he is just such a, a warm, gracious uh, individual. So Barry really in some ways is responsible for this book's existence because it was during the recording of this episode with him on my podcast, Into the Impossible, uh, that he said something – uh, that was kind of interesting and provocative to me. And then I went further learning the rubinic skills that I've learned from you. Um, and I went deeper and I, what, what are you talking about? He said to me, Dave, and it blew me away. He, I said, when you were young, were you like this stereotypical brilliant kid in math? And so he's like, no, I was never, you know, I was good. I was hard work. I was smart. Uh, but you know, I, he grew up in Oklahoma and, uh, and then later moved to LA and, and so forth. And then he was just like persistent. And he always wanted to do a certain type of work called particle physics. And, um, you know, but he was never under this impression that he was, you know, great. And I said, did you ever have the imposter syndrome, you know, when you were at UC Berkeley working for these famous Nobel laureate, you know, physicists, did you ever feel like you weren't good enough? He goes, what do you mean, did I? I still feel the imposter syndrome. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, I feel it worse than ever. And I said, you got to explain. What are you talking about? And he said, when you win the Nobel Prize, you go to Stockholm, you meet the king, you bend down and he puts this golden, gilded, engraved image of uh, Alfred Nobel on your neck and you get a check for some fraction or 100% of a million dollar uh, payout. And uh, and you get this portrait, this really beautiful portrait. I tried to reproduce the portraits of a really nice work of an artist in this book. I think he did a wonderful job. And um, and 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 then you have to sign this ledger that says, yes, I received my Nobel Prize and all the accoutrements and delicacies therein. And, uh, and he said, when I did that, I'm a very curious person. I couldn't resist who signed it before me. So he turned back the pages. He saw Richard Feynman, Marie Curie, and he saw Albert Einstein. And he said, Dave, and the hair still stands up. He said, I'm not worthy. I am not Einstein. I am not good enough to be there. And it made it me feel completely inadequate, completely un up to the ta not up to the task. And now I'm in the same league as Einstein. I do not deserve it. And I said, thinking quickly, I said, Barry, guess what? You know who also had the imposter syndrome? Albert Einstein. Because Albert Einstein was in awe and wholly inadequate before Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. And he felt Isaac Newton, Dave, can you imagine if Einstein were tweeting today? He said the following. He said, <laughs> Isaac Newton revolutionized not only science but Western culture, Western civilization. He would be canceled immediately. He said, Newton – had more influence on civilization, not just science, than any human before or since, meaning including Albert Einstein, who was writing this about Newton. And I said, but wait, Barry, it doesn't stop there. Isaac Newton had the severe case of the imposter syndrome. He said, what do you mean? I said, he felt completely inadequate before his idol, not a scientist, but uh, Jesus Christ. In fact, Newton said his highest accomplishment in life is that he died a virgin 
like Jesus Christ. And he wanted to emulate Christ in every way. So I think it's very fascinating. And guess what? You know, I don't know. Maybe Jesus didn't have an, <laughs> maybe Jesus didn't feel the imposter sin, but he was pretty humble. And I, I think he was a, a pretty brilliant human being. So, um, or God, depending on, on your perspective, right? So uh, I think we all can learn this lesson because if you think that you're the greatest person and you have these great contributions and you have like, I won the Nobel Prize, like there are guys, I'm not going to say who, but there are people in the book who said, I don't have the imposter syndrome. I deserve this freaking thing, you know, like Flavor Flav with a huge me- medallion <laughs> around his neck. Um, <laughs> but they, they feel like they deserve, but not all of them. And I think that it's, it was a dichotomy that I wasn't suspecting. It was a dichotomy that you need to have, like I said, humility and swagger, but um, but you need to be very careful about it because the imposter syndrome is born out of insecurity, and people that are arrogant and and unpleasant, they're also insecure, mm-hmm. right? The old joke, and you know this from your dog, you know, the smallest dog barks the loudest, right? That's that's the thing, right? You talk to Jocko on your podcast, Jocko's not like, oh, I'm going to kick your, you know, he's just right. like. Right. Whatever, man. Like, I'll run away. Like, I'll put on my 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 running shoes and get out of there. So, I think that's really interesting because it's very rare that the opposite, two different traits in diametric opposition, come from the same source. Insecurity is responsible for imposter syndrome and for the uh, for the arrogance that that many non humble people feel. So. I felt it was important to distill this and who better to learn it from than someone who's achieved and gotten into the promised land of my field is the Nobel Prize. There's no higher thing in all of science, maybe even all of culture, civilization and society than the Nobel Prize. And so I felt these people, in particular Barry, and I was so honored that he wrote the foreword to the book um, uh, as well. That was really a, a great honor that I do not feel worthy of. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about academia instead of nonstop yelling, check out our academia playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.